Hello, hello. Another week, another episode, or as my amazing co-host Sebastian like to say, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, and where are you? <laughs> well, I'm... I'm. <laughs> Here's the next yeah, question. I'm where I'm always. Uh, I'm at home. I'm in my studio. The important question is, where the heck are you today? Well, I am in South Africa, Johannesburg, for work. I think that's what I'm supposed to do at least. <laughs> so yes, so almost the same time zone. It's just one hour ahead of Germany. Yeah, very cool. Have you been here? Yeah, I've been in South Africa a couple of years ago um, on vacation, and I've been there for business once. Cape Town is really, really nice. So I can highly recommend it to visit. I visited Cape Town three years ago. That's the only thing I know actually about South Africa. I did not do any Kruger or safari park have you yeah i i did a little bit of a of a safari down in cape town not the kruger but uh a wildlife park all the same where you can see the big five and uh yeah travel a little bit around and be impressed by nature and animals so what's uh maybe surprising to some actually when i talk about south africa i um it's obvious to me but it may not be obvious to everyone south african cities are among the most dangerous in the world and and what's the second thing which is which is dangerous? Uh, oh, sorry, surprising. The second thing that is surprising is that uh, at the top of the list of the most dangerous cities in the world, you have also U.S. cities. Um, if you look at the homicide rate by firearm, uh, you have U.S. cities, South African cities, and a bunch of Latin American cities in Brazil and Central America. Uh, and I don't know. I was surprised that people were not aware of that. And I just got a security notice uh, on my email uh, how. Tourists just yesterday got attacked going from the airport here in Johannesburg just to get to their accommodation. Right? So they just got uh, car carjacked uh, on the way. Uh, but I don't know if people know that, but it's not a very safe country, at least in the cities. Wonderful. So take good care of you. You have a history of being uh, ripped off your cell phone in foreign countries. So Well, that happened once and I was in Bali, which is I not supposed to be the worst country in the, on the planet or the place on the planet. But but you missed the point, Doug. This is a perfect transition to safety. Uh, that was my attempt. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> see? I, I gave you, I, I threw a line at you so you could just seize it and you're just like, okay, be safe. Well, no, that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you know, that's, uh, the, the problem is that I don't, uh, don't see any of your subtle cues and when you give me the ah, look, the, the move on look. That, oh, uh, yes, the wink. Yeah, the wink. The, the wink. That's, you know, the, the fight. The, the 30 second wink, you know, I'm closing my eyes for 30 seconds. <laughs> because yeah. the motion today is about safety. And now, somehow. now you're doing Not it yourself. All. Oh, gosh. Well, I, yeah. I have to, you know, try to save it somehow. <laughs> so, so today we're going to talk about trust and safety. Not at all about physical integrity, but the policies that you have on social media to make users safe from a bunch of harassment and porn and what have you. Or maybe it's uh, to make the companies safe, like, uh, you know. Or maybe to make companies safe, or maybe it's just, a, and this is the motion we're debating today, it's just a fig leaf for censorship. Fig leaf, for those who are not English native speakers, means it's just a cover uh, for censorship. It's just a fake cover for censorship. So the motion, just to summarize it, is trust and safety policies on social media websites are mainly a fig leaf for censorship. And as usual, we flip the coin, and that means that, Dirk, you will be in favor of that motion. You're going to claim that it is indeed censorship, or mainly censorship, and I will be against that motion. Let's do this. Okay, let's do this. Sebastian goes first and argues against the motion. Every single day in the news, there's literally not a single day in the news if you open the New York Times or The Guardian or Le Monde in France, that you don't see some comment, some article about fake news or some child imagery which surfaced on some social media website and was not captured by the company and removed quickly enough. And there's a lot of horrible content out there. I don't know if people realize there's millions, literally millions of videos and images which are uploaded every single day, which are extremely harmful, which is either child sexual abuse material or 
uh, uh, petty scams or, you know, that email from a relative who's stranded abroad and they need a bank transfer to get home safely. This is happening like millions of times every day. And I'm not talking, at least in my, in my little segment, about restricting or banning conservative positions on the political side of things. I'm really focusing on these aspects of protection of uh, the user. Now, deciding what content is allowed on these platforms is a big responsibility. Like, this is something that is not easy to tackle. There's a balance that needs to be found. The additional thing here is it's important to enforce consistent measures. And that's also the area which is not easy or always shifting and trying to adapt to a moving landscape. And you don't know what what is acceptable necessarily that easily, especially in one country versus another. And that can be very controversial. And that's why we're debating today. Uh, We're probably exaggerating the trait when we're debating today, because as you can see in these news articles, there is not a simple solution. So the goal, obviously, for these policies is to achieve both accuracy in detecting really harmful content and scale. So let's take, for instance, um, violent extremism online. So initially, a lot of companies would, would use manual reviews by users, but then gradually what you would have is using machines, algorithms to detect it, and then it's sent to subject matter experts. So here's what I'm highlighting, and I'm going to conclude on this, is the importance to build all these policies in partnerships, in partnerships with other NGOs, with tech companies, with government, with the police, with various user groups, so that we can all agree on what is the red line. And this is not an easy uh, balance to attain, but this is why it's so critical to have it so we can protect, especially younger users or uh, potentially more uh, sensitive users on, on the internet. So this is not about censorship. It's really about protection and safety of our users. Now, it's Dirk's turn. Let's hear his argument. Oh, so we need protection from people sharing harmful things. And companies out there are there to help us, to protect us from things we are not supposed to see because they are, oh yeah, again, harmful, especially to children because, you know, social media is filled with children who have no way to protect themselves from harmful messages and violent extremism. I'm a bit sarcastic here. The question that I have in my mind when I read through the trust policies and thanks to our motion, I actually for once read the trust and content policies of platforms like Facebook. The question I have in my mind is, what did we do before social media? Right. We ignored people that shared violent content. We shut them out until they moved on. Because in the end, what we seem to ignore is that it's the members of the social media platforms that share that particular content. If it comes to violent and brutal content, I'm actually with you um, that maybe there is some policing required and maybe it serves to create a better experience in a friendly environment. The challenge, though, is that those platforms are actually not creating these policies just because they are against violent content, because it seems to be that violent content attracts a lot of interaction those platforms want to have. They create these policies because they are bound to do that through law. And and, uh, that leads me to the next question, Koi Bono. Who has the advantage of content policies being enforced? And content policies go pretty far these days. Race, ethnicity, national origin, religious affiliation, sexual orientation, caste, sex, gender, gender identity, serious disease or disability. There is a whole range of categories, for instance, Facebook lists that are subject to be removed once you raise a discussion that can be seen as offensive. All these categories are basically enforced through platforms, because otherwise you risk getting a penalty. And therefore, you're nothing more than an extension of state censorship. But because your company enforcing it, people can claim it's not really state censorship. It's companies serving their communities. I do indeed think it's a fig leaf for censorship in the end. Now it's Sebastian's turn. Let's hear his rebuttal. I'd like to go through some of the points that you raised. First of all, you were sarcastic when mentioning that children uh, had uh, uh, no way to protect themselves, uh, implying that they had ways to protect themselves. 
Uh, I actually think they don't. I actually think they know more than their parents on how to navigate the internet. And and that's my second point. The harmful content is exposed to them, is thrown to their faces. Unlike the past where you would ignore it, as you said, or it would not affect you, would not be, I don't know, you would not like take a book that could be harmful to you. In this case, you have ads for instance, on Facebook, which can lead you to, let's say, conspiracy theories or theories which are borderline racist. And one, th- one thing leads to another. While I don't mind controversial uh, conspiracy theories in themselves, they can lead you to gradually go to an area which is less of a gray area, but indeed areas which are harmful to you. On YouTube, same thing. You have recommended videos. So if there's no uh, uh, policies in place to remove harmful content, you would have videos and be recommended by an algorithm uh, to go to that to those harmful videos. You also mentioned that violent, violent content somehow, you didn't say these words exactly, but it attracts users and it is in the interest of these social media websites to actually have violent content. I don't buy that. I really think that online trolls and online bullies um, drive people away. And on the other side, if you have a safe environment where you can express yourself and not bullied, by one or two individuals or toxic people, then you will actually stay and share more content, which is what the companies want. In fact, publishers, advertisers want the same thing. They did remove their ads from YouTube when they were not happy where their ads were shown on the videos which are too controversial. So I really don't buy the fact that violent content or harmful content actually uh, attracts people. Um, I want to cover a, a few more things. I want to mention how it's a subtle distinction between different cases. You have violent extremism, which I mentioned before. You have things like hate speech, and that requires a different approach uh, because you have different standards in different countries. So for this, you need to have a team or teams of language specialists and people who understand the law. And this is not just automatic detection. So that's why it's a careful balance. And it's not something which is completely uh, a one-size-fits-all for every kind of content. And this cannot be done in isolation. This is why I, I'm happy to see that all these companies are trying to do this in partnership with each other or with uh, NGOs and the government or the police. And nothing is static, by the way. These policies have evolved over time. And we must be responsive because the kind of content that exists is evolving also. Um, other companies, if I'm not mistaken, are also coming up with external councils and boards. And I know there's some criticism about who is part of that council, but we can get there. We can get there with you know, a geographic, the geographically diverse uh, council. We can have, make sure they have left-leaning people or right-leaning people on the political spectrum. And in the end, as you've mentioned, by the way, if you're not happy, anyone can virtually launch their own server today from home. You can express your content, uh, whatever you want, on your own server. It's very easy. And worst case, these are private companies, right? They do whatever they want. As you mentioned, this is not state censorship, which is when we talk about censorship, we generally understand this as imposed by the government, for instance, what's happened in China. So I really don't believe that trust and safety policies uh, are a way to disguise censorship on social media websites. Next up, Dirk. I'd like to connect a few dots for you. You mentioned, for instance, hate speech. The interesting thing about hate speech is that a lot of the content that is being banned these days on social media is not bannable in public discourse. So when it comes to the local laws in in different countries, a lot of what constitutes as hate speech, for instance, on Facebook or Twitter, is perfectly legitimate discussion material in public discourse or even in the media governed by the right to free speech and free opinion forming. Now, I find it very telling that governments try to enforce, let's say, the cleaning of public discourse on private companies because by uh, demanding a certain level of uh, let's call a review for content that's being posted what you implicitly uh, threaten with is uh, as i said earlier a penalty or a fine companies will then overdo it they will try to avoid the fine and rather err on the side of removing things than on the side of permitting things because in the end It's their business risk and it's easy for them to just enforce it because, as you said, it's a private company. They can enforce what 
ever. Now, I would argue in the moment a platform like Facebook or Twitter is so prevalent that everybody is discussing and forming opinions on it, it becomes a little bit like a public square. So the question is, why are we allowing ourselves to have, be, uh, to have harder regulations on these platforms than in regular public discourse? And why is it that we seem to forget that uh, there is a strong force coming out of politics and governments that kind of push in that direction? You mentioned people being exposed to hate speech and such. Let me tell you something. Social network is called social for a reason. There are multiple people on that platform that share that content. So if you're exposed to fake news and, and hateful content, chances are you're exposed to it because your friends shared it. Now, I'm all for banning, for instance, ads for minors or um, reviewing ads on the platform. But I wouldn't review general statements people make. It should be perfectly fine if I'm in a close group with my 20 hand-selected buddies and no one of them is uh, anonymous um, to share whatever I deem uh, suitable for that group. And if them, uh, if they start complaining about it, then they are then they are within their rights to kick me out of that group. That's how this self-cleaning, self-servicing works in the real life. Why don't we implement something similar in social media? And I tell you why. Because it's basically just censorship disguised as trust and safety policies. And now on to Sebastian. In conclusion on my side, I would say, I would repeat that there is a lot of horrible content out there, like a lot. I, don't th I think we, we don't realize the, the amount that is filtered, thankfully, and that we're not exposed to. And these policies are necessary. And I think you're saying the same thing when it comes to Uh, extreme pornography or child abuse material, whatever. I think we will not disagree on this. You mentioned an interesting point just now, actually, uh, which I want to have the time to debate on, on the private versus public groups. I don't have a good answer to that. Um, the thing is, what happens if you select as an admin of a group, private group, that becomes public. You know, you'd like maybe you would have like an, a review which goes through the, the content that was shared. I think that's an interesting point. And that leads me to my final point, which I, I hope is the most compelling here, which is it's a balance. And that's not an easy balance. And what makes me hopeful is that we're doing this, when I say we, is like all these social media companies are doing this together with various partners. Unlike maybe censorship or state censorship, censorship which is one-sided, or unlike the past, I feel, I, this is what I'm observing now, I feel these companies are taking this problem seriously and, and, are, and are engaging the public, the authorities, and various NGOs to try and solve this problem. So that makes me hopeful that we're not going to be in a situation of censorship because we're doing this together, even if it's a tricky balance. And that's why we, I don't think we'll lead, this will lead to increased censorship. Dirk. Posting content that's illegal is one thing. I completely agree. There is no place for child pornography or extreme violence on social media or anywhere else. If things are illegal, then they ought to be taken down. And this is clearly what those teams in companies like Facebook and Twitter should be paid and respected for doing. The trust and safety policies and the content policies go much further, though. There is a lot that's not permittable to be posted and a lot more than just what's illegal in countries. And this is where I caution against, because the question is what forces drive these policies and these policies, uh, whether you like it or not, they govern how we discuss in public, how we share content, what kind of content we are allowed to share. And I personally think it should not be the place of companies to judge this and to censor this. And I find it telling that a lot of the demand for pushing out censorship rules and tightening it and going against hate speech actually comes from politics and governments. And that is what leads me to assuming it's more about censorship and less about having a clean platform. Another debate in the can, in the box. But is, uh, what do you think? As you said, it's about striking a balance, but I do think we are overdoing it. I do think it's a problem that we ask 
social media companies to clean our speech for us. And I also think there are a couple of incompatibilities, culturally and otherwise, between what we constitute as offensive and police-worthy and what other cultures and, and, and uh, societies um, would, would call that way. And it's, yeah, so I think as a result, we often really see, we, we build censorship machines these days. Uh, the latest iteration of that is the Article 13 that um, is debated in the EU right now, which basically institutes upload filters for every piece of content that's being posted. Basically, insta uh, um, installing companies as gatekeepers for content that is being published. And I see all of this mm. with worry, I have to say. I agree with you, and I, I think this... I'm surprised, and, and I'm pleasantly surprised for me, at least from the debate perspective, but I'm surprised you did not cover the censorship of um, political opinions or the, or the apparent censorship, because we don't know if it's really happening. But this is actually, for what, on my side, what worries me most. Um, I I'm, I'm, I'm don't like it too much that we ban uh, political or even conspiracy opinions opinions like i don't know i haven't looked into details though so i can't really talk much about it but like you probably read about or heard about Infowars, mm -hmm. right alex jones yeah i'm i'm surprised he was banned from all these social media websites now i have not read his content but as far as i know it seemed more like like an extreme conservative guy rather than someone who's posting like pornographic content right or child abuse imagery and this is where I, it makes me feel uncomfortable. Of course, I have by in no way any affinity with this person. But I'm surprised we're going the way of banning these guys from, from platforms, even if what they say is insane or, or, or toxic to a debate, but not toxic to the point of, I don't know, uh, maybe I don't, I don't know how to express it. Properly, in, in case of, to the point of what? I don't know. In case of Alex Jones, it goes further than that, though. Alex Jones was uh, was giving hate speech and was sharing uh, thoughts that then led to others being in real life discriminated and even forced to to relocate and all these things. So that was in the end why he was uh, banned from platforms. Of course, he's he himself colors this as political censorship. I don't want to excuse any of this, but I do feel we are getting more and more restrictive. I remember in the early days of the internet when everybody was posting anonymous, then basically the thinking was being allowed to be anonymous um, basically um, provides a platform where people can post ugly things. And still there were forums and uh, news groups that were actually very nice in tone and well policed. And these days where everybody is forced to give their real name and we basically know everybody's identity, or whether they like it or not, um, we still police more and um, we keep policing more and more what people post online. And this worries me because at some point we, we should learn how to engage with, uh, with this kind of behavior in a way that resolves for it instead of just hiding it away. I, I guess in this in this case, to what you're mentioning is, do you want to ban the person altogether? Do you ban their content? You know, if they if they instigate violence or they try to get people to react and harass others, mm -hmm. then do you ban the person altogether? Or do you ban that content? Right? I I do have a problem when you when you like altogether shut down someone. Uh, it seems like extreme extreme measure. I mean, if you look at our justice system in our in our democracies, or at least the ones which are recognized as democracies. Once you get out of jail, you, in theory, you get a second chance. It's not, in reality, it's not as easy, but in theory, that's what happens, right? You pay your debt. So why on these, you know, media, social media websites would you be banned for life, basically, for, for let's say, an offense to policies? It seems such an extreme measure. Um, again, I'm not defending this guy in particular. I don't know what he says in, in detail. Just read the news. So it's, it's, it's filtered already. Uh, I'm in my little bubble. Uh, back to another episode. But um, I don't know. I'm just, I just, I'm, this is what makes me feel uncomfortable on that debate. I'm not worried about the, all the other aspects of, of like the obvious ones like porn and child image, like child abuse imagery and that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm concerned about the political aspect. Yeah, I agree. It may also be worth a separate uh, debate. Was it right to ban Alex Jones? <laughs> That's a clickbait debate, no? <laughs> <laughs> Or another debate. Does clickbait even yeah, exist? Yeah, why not? We can do that. 
worries. Let's do the bait in one. <laughs> uh, nice. Five things why clickbait is not existing. Number three made me cry. But uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I have to admit when I when we came up with that motion, I really have been stunned by the amount of news articles every single day on that topic. Literally, like fake news and and conspiracy theories and. Like just yesterday, I was reading an article about how there was an increased proportion of people believing that the Earth is flat because of an increase uh, because of number of videos on YouTube which have proven popular and have convinced yeah, people. But I do think like every single day there's something. I do think there is a deeper problem here that um, we we clearly cannot resolve. But the problem is not that there is fake news on those platforms. That's a symptom. I think the problem is that people forget how to how to use critical thinking and scientific methods. And part of it is, uh, you know, if if every idiot in the White House can claim to be a climate expert now, um, then, uh, yeah, where are we when it comes to evaluating opinions and things we hear, hear and see? So people people kind of stop really trusting in, in critical thinking. And maybe instead of banning everything we deem ban-worthy, we should, we should pro promote... Uh, the scientific method, uh, trustworthy media channels, and uh, critical thinking a little bit more. Amen. <laughs> yes. Uh, let us know what you thought about this debate. You, dear le listeners, we don't censor anything. Dirk does, does all the censorship in between the recording and this <laughs> wonderfully crafted episode. So it's all stripped out of all the horrible things i say thank you Dirk, for doing this yeah and also i cut our arguments to the proper size so we are sticking to our our length <laughs> to our two three and one minute each. yes yeah. sometimes anyway thank you so much for listening let us know what you think you can do so on the web page you can go to the web page to debate.eu and leave your vote on the link of this episode little thumbs up thumbs down thingy and uh, yeah, we are still in our little contest to see who won the debate and your vote is how we win. Right. Thank you for doing that. And stay tuned for our next episode, hopefully on back on our weekly schedule. Definitely. Thank you. Thanks, Sebastian. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.